the Franco Modigliani Professor of Finance and Economics in the Sloan School of Management at MIT. He received his PhD in economics from Harvard in 1970, having served on the faculty of the University of Pennsylvania and Yale before being moved to MIT in 1998. His research centers around stochastic models and financial markets, which is exactly the subject of the spring quarter emphasis at the Institute for Math and its applications, which is just getting underway. Ross is well known for numerous innovations in financial modeling, most notably arbitrage pricing theory, or APT, risk neutral pricing, the cost ingersoll loss model of term structure of interest rates, and the binomial model for pricing derivatives. His models and analyses can not only be found in about 100 papers he's authored and co-authored, several textbooks, but also at the base of the financial product, uh, per, the base of the financial practices of major security trading firms. Ross has been the recipient of numerous awards and prizes, including the Graham and Dodd Award for Financial Writing, the Pomerantz Prize for Excellence in Options Research, the Leo Malamed Prize for the Best Research by a Business School <coughs> Professor, and the 1996 Financial Engineer of the Year Award. He's a fellow of the Econometric Society, a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and a past president of the American Finance Association. Besides his academic life, Ross is a co-founder and co-chairman of Roland Ross Asset Management, a firm which manages several billion dollars of equity investments worldwide, and where many of Ross's ideas are put into practice. He's on the boards of many governmental and private entities, including Freddie Mac, the, financial home, the Federal Home Loan Mortgage Corporation, Caltech, the university you might have heard of, and Tia Kraft, where, by the way, my pension is invested, so don't spend too much time doing these. <laughs> I began by saying that Ross holds the Franco Modigliani chair at MIT. Franco Modigliani was a Nobel Prize winning economist who endowed the chair, and he has some good advice to people who, like you and like me, are in the audience today, have a chance to listen to Stephen Ross. So I'll close by quoting Franco Modigliani. He said, listen carefully. Everything Ross says is like gold. <laughs> Thank, you, Stephen Ross. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doug. If you watch, gold prices have been going down lately. So. <laughs> uh, this is a talk, this is a fun talk for me to give a difficult audience because uh, the lingua franca of what I do, neoclassical finance, is mathematics. And some of you who are steeped in mathematics will say there's not enough of that here. And those of you who aren't will say there's too much of it here. So no one will be happy, which I guess is the goal of a good talk. I'll offend everybody in one fashion or another. So. Uh, I actually will start off, and you will find if you're in a particular camp that this talk is somewhat offensive, because this is a talk about neoclassical finance, and it's the perspective that someone in neoclassical finance takes of a new fad, I'll call it, or certainly a new wave in economics in general, finance in particular, which is the rise of behavioral finance. And I'm going to talk about this in a completely unbiased fashion giving an absolutely neutral and <laughs> open look at this. But you may not think so when we're done. Uh, I began uh, after a somewhat torturous route in economics and mathematics and a variety of other things. I wound up in finance uh, randomly. The story of how I got into finance is, is interesting. I went around looking for a lecture. I was about to leave economics in dismay and uh, well, I guess leave it in dismay and leave it in disappointment. Uh, and someone said, you ought to go to a finance lecture. This was when I was at Wharton. And I said, there's something interesting going on. So I went to a lecture and it was this tall, asterisk fellow talking, and his name was Fisher Black, and he was talking about something called the Black-Scholes model. And I thought, this is really fascinating stuff. This is what I thought science was about. The next talk was Richard Roll talking about estimating term structure models. And so I made a good Bayesian inference. I said, this is the average quality of people in finance. <laughs> so, the, rest of the, the rest of the seminar was disappointing, but I was hooked and got into finance. And I got into it because, and this is important to the story we're going to tell, neoclassical finance is really, for me, a science. And it has all the characteristics of a science. 
uh, at least certainly of a natural science. Uh, as I said, the technology is a mathematical technology. That's what we use. We use it to build theories and build uh, formal models and structures which are designed to be about observables. They're designed to be taken to the data and tested on the data. And the data is one of the richest bodies of data you'll find in the social sciences, or for that matter, in any uh, arena where you can't conduct experiments or where experiments are difficult. It's an enormous, beautiful body of data. And the object of the theorizing that we engage in is to explain this data set. So it's not simply to, to weave tales about things. Theories actually die if they don't explain this data set. Uh, but there are good ways to do it and bad ways to do it, as we'll see. The underpinnings of neoclassical finance are really two principles. The first is efficient markets, which sometimes we, we forget in the haste to build stochastic differential equations and to run through the formal structure. Underlying all of that is efficient markets. And efficient markets means that information gets into prices, and the information that you're using in your model is captured in the prices. And that means that the processes you use for describing the motion of prices in this, in this world and presumably of, uh, to some lesser degree of some of the other variables like volatility, but we have to talk about that. That, that mechanism, those models, have to be non-anticipatory in a mathematical sense. So they can't be things that look forward into the future. They have to be conditioned on the information that you possess at a point in time. And that's, a really, that, that's sort of a subtle distinction which shows up in all the models and we sort of ignore it, but it's there. Efficient markets at an intuitive level says that the information is captured in the prices. It would be several lectures to talk about what that means, at the end of which you may not be certain of exactly what it means, because it's one of those wonderful insights which, despite its great intuitive appeal, I won't say it's defied our ability to put it into a formal context, but it really has been kind of uh, slippery. It's more difficult to put into a context than we would expect it to be. But having said that, we use it as a tool all the time. And the second underpinning is that there isn't any arbitrage. In the absence of arbitrage, coupled with efficient markets, is what defines option pricing theory. Risk neutral pricing is the mechanism by which we are able to obtain valuations in these markets. And in fact, modeling has become very much the establishment of a risk neutral pricing measure and then looking at variables in the world and trying to figure out what that measure actually is. How do you actually price things? So in effect, it's kind of a formalization of saying, here's an asset whose price I don't know. What I'll do is I'll project it on the things that I do know, and presumably I'll be able to get a valuation. And in a large number of circumstances, you get a deterministic valuation that way, which is really kind of unique and kind of special in this world. It's very special. The theory of derivatives and option pricing is based upon it. Uh, I believe and you might at peril dispute this, I believe that the theory of derivatives is the single most successful uh, theoretical apparatus in all of social science, bar none. Certainly the most successful in economics, and I believe economics is at least as successful as the other social sciences. So that, you know, I, I think I must have offended 5% of the people here. <laughs> The theory of derivatives, as I said, was how I got into the field. Let me give you a little bit of the discomfiture I have with traditional economics. Uh, after a one year of graduate school, where I had steeped myself in statistics and econometrics and thought I knew quite something, I needed some money in the summer, so I went and got a job with a consulting firm in Boston. And my objective of this was to predict the price of Scotch whiskey in Massachusetts. That was my job. So I took this very seriously. I had this wonderful data of how people bought Scotch whiskey. I was um, I had not, I've been trained as a physicist, so that was my one year of economics. And try as I could, I could not get the demand curve to slope downward. The higher the price, the more whiskey they bought. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> this was very disillusioning for a fledgling scientist. Now, I, I'd gotten into this stuff lured by game theory and linear programming and things, which I thought were the mathematics of economics only to discover that demand curve sloped upward and supply curve sloped downward was very disconcerting. In option pricing, it's not a question of whether you get the sign right. In option pricing, 
the things slope in the right direction. It's a question of whether you're within a nickel or a dime on a $5 price. And it's really a question of fine structure. So you open up the newspaper and you look how the price of an option varies with the underlying parameters that define it. And you take out your little pocket calculator or now your Excel sheet, you do whatever it is you want, and you get that price within a nickel across all the characteristics. And then, of course, we fight all about the nickel. We have a lot of interesting theories about the nickel. But don't lose sight of the fact that those are fights about nickels. They're not fights about dollars. They're not fights about the sign, which is part of the success of this theory. Asset pricing models are another part of what we do. And I'm leaving out whole hosts of things in finance. Asset pricing models are another thing that are less successful. I think it's fair to say they've been quite unsuccessful from an empirical perspective. And to some extent, they put the lie to what I said originally, which is when you come up with a theory, you actually bring it to the data and see if it comports with the theory. Uh, asset pricing models just generally don't fit the theory. It's, as a friend once said, he, the, the, uh, the data has never met a theory it liked. And I think that's unfortunate, but the theories are quite elegant, and so we keep them for their aesthetics, even though they don't seem to explain very much. And also because we don't have many alternatives. It is a question of alternatives. What's a better thing? Well, there is a group of folks who argue that there are alternatives, and they do so by saying that the key assumptions of neoclassical finance really can't be accepted. One assumption is that, one key assumption as I see it, is that there are a very well financed, perhaps a small number, of smart investors whose objective is to close the arbitrage opportunities that they see in the world. So if there is a possibility of borrowing at 5% and lending at 6%, folks will flood into the market to do exactly that. Now, of course, they do this, they engage in this activity, and so they must be rewarded for it. So it's not exactly tautological. So what I'm thinking when I say that the market is efficient and that there aren't arbitrage opportunities in the market, I'm really describing kind of a first order effect. An arbitrage is this chance to borrow at 5% and lend at 6% and the more general forms of it. So I'm saying there aren't any opportunities like that. That doesn't mean there really aren't. It means that for an outside observer like myself coming in and studying it, I won't find in the data these opportunities. They will have disappeared before I see them. The joke we tell in the first year finance class is about the finance professor and the student walking down the hall, and the student sees a $20 bill on the ground and bends down to pick it up. And the professor says, don't bother. If it was really there, someone else would have picked it up already. Yeah. <laughs> the arbitrages who engage in this activity are rewarded. That's a necessity for the closing of arbitrage positions. But the critical thing here, it is a theory about sharks. It's not a theory about the rational man. It is fundamentally distinct from demand and supply. Demand and supply, prices get set at a margin. And the margin is, in large sense, determined by the average supplier and the average demander. That's where you put the margin, in effect. That's not what happens in the financial markets. The margin is set by the very, very brightest and the very best financed. And so you, you can expect, I would intuitively expect the price to be a better pricing vehicle for the asset than the price for shoes. It never surprises me if shoes go up and down in price. All these things can happen. Demand shifts, supply shifts. But for a capital asset in a liquid market where all these folks are out there trying to make a buck guessing where it's going to be, it's really tough for an outsider to come in and make a buck doing this. Okay. How much money do people make doing this? Well, by a rough measure, I would say that uh, here's an example of how one gets to this sort of thing. It's a back of the envelope calculation. A study about uh, four years ago on hedge funds, which are in this business of doing it, studied about $150 billion worth of hedge fund assets. They are now about $500 billion, depending on how you count it. And they discovered they had an excess return on average of 4% a year. That's 4% above correcting for their risks and everything. So that's about $6 billion a year that they were making that if the theory was perfectly right, they shouldn't make. And I probably undercounted by a factor of two. So I'll raise it to $12 billion. 
And then uh, banks and funds, they do similar kinds of activities. So let's double it again to 24 billion. And I probably missed some stuff too. We'll double it again to 50 billion dollars. So there's 50 billion dollars of stuff lying around in the world that pe people pick up every year. And that is really an overstatement of what happens. There are 50 trillion dollars worth of assets in the world. Financial assets. 50 billion divided by 50 trillion is a small number. It's one over a thousand. The issue is, how efficient is the market? Is it very efficient, a little efficient? Well, presumably, these people in this business are trying to make money that are making money off a one one thousandth phenomena. It's not a question of is the glass half full or the glass half empty. It's a question of whether there's a drop missing or two. So that's the intuition that I bring to this. Here's the behavioral challenge to what I've gone through, to the intuition I bring and to this structure that we've developed over many years. The twin pillars of what they say, first, people aren't rational. That came as a shock to me. Uh, <laughs> one only has to spend a few, a few hours with my family to realize that there's enormous irrationality in any kind of a social situation. As I said, fortunately, it's a theory about sharks. I consider that to be quite off the point. It's not about whether the average person is rational or irrational. We're all irrational by some theoretical perspective. It's a question of whether our irrationality shows up in prices, which is a very much harder issue. The second thing they do, which I think is an extraordinarily productive activity on their part, is that they argue, the behavioralists, that science progresses through these cataclysmic paradigm shifts that Kuhn defined, a historian of science. He said, what happens with any theory, phlogiston is an example, you know, the data starts to mount to you really can't continue to accept a theory. You're just trying to fit too many square pegs and round holes. It just doesn't work anymore. And at that point, there's some sort of a cataclysmic shift and new theories develop. You know? it, it took 600 pages for him to explain this. Samuelson had it more pithy. Science progresses funeral by funeral. Yeah. <laughs> so basically, new theories replace old ones. Old ones die. Sometimes the old ones die before the new ones come in. Sometimes the new ones come in before the old ones die. At any moment of time, there are 100 pretenders trying to unseat an existing theory. Of the 100 pretenders, one will succeed. Identifying which one will succeed is probably as hard as identifying whether the market will go up or down. Here's what behavioral science, they take Kuhn to heart and think of it as a positive theory. Uh, it's more defined by what it doesn't like today about neoclassical finance than what it has to offer as an alternative. I think they accept that. Uh, the basic methodology is to go to the psychology literature and to look in psychology to try and find explanations for phenomena that seem inexplicable in the financial markets. That's the most interesting thing about this whole wave of thought. And there is a large wave of literature on this. The most interesting thing is that they find these phenomena in the markets, anomalous phenomena, that seem very clearly to be at odds with that kind of pristine neoclassical theory I gave. And they argue that these force us to abandon traditional neoclassical finance. And once again, they say prices are determined by every man. They can't be arbitrary. The average man determines the prices. Let me give you an example of one of these things that I really quite like. There's several examples, but I'll give you the one I like best. You all know about MCI, the communications company that got absorbed and is now part of all this stuff. Well, before it was absorbed, MCI was a $30 billion company, $35 billion company, traded on the NYSE. And as you'd expect, every time there was good news about MCI, the price went up, and every time there was good, bad news, MCI would go down. There's good news about the telephone business, it would rise. Bad news about the telephone business, it would fall. Which really does capture our basic sense that you know, prices respond to information and prices contain and reflect that information. Just one problem. MCI didn't stand for the ticker symbol for MCI, the telephone company. MCI was the ticker symbol for the Massachusetts Convertible Investor Trust. <laughs> which was a, a $200 million fund, not a $36 billion, a $200 million fund that bought bonds 
and held no telecommunication bonds. <laughs> but every time good news came out about the telephone business, it went up. And every time bad news came out, it went down. When there was a split or a merger or some action at MCI, it would go up or it would go down, you know. Uh, this is quite anomalous. This is very strange. In my asset management business, we knew about this and tried to profit by it. But it was an interesting lesson. You couldn't. If it went up, you just couldn't find shares. It was only $200 million. You just couldn't find it and short it. And if it went down, you know, you could buy 100 shares. There just wasn't any liquidity on the thing at all. So it was sort of trading within a band of, it was kind of fun to watch it go up and down. But, you know, if you tried to arbitrage it, you couldn't. It was well inside that $50 billion of money that could be made. This is a characteristic of most of these anomalies. Not all, but most of the anomalies. One of the characteristics. So these anomalies seem to me to have associated with them four, oops, I pressed the wrong button. And go back. Let me hit something else. Oh boy. Let's see, is there an exit? Okay, let's go previous. All right, we need expertise here. Oh, hit the escape. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I went to Caltech, we were theorists. All right, did it again. I can do this. <laughs> Let's do this. Here we go. Examples of anomalies. So I gave you the MCI case and I said it was small. I'll, I'll try this again. Let's see. Okay. There's some others. Momentum P. Internet stocks in the whole U.S. market are overvalued. You hear that all the time. I hear that from lots of people. I didn't hear it as much before. I heard it after, you know. Bubbles are easy things to identify after they burst. They're kind of hard to identify before they burst. But yes, that is an interesting line. This article about MCI is titled, Massively Confused Investors Making Conspicuously Ignorant Choices. <laughs> Here are the characteristics of these anomalies. They're small, which means they're not scalable. They're, not li they're illiquid. Uh, I once ran a mortgage shop, which is a place that trades mortgages back and forth. And mortgages are wonderfully esoteric instruments. There's currently about a million and a half different kinds of little pieces of mortgages that trade in the U.S. market. And trade is a little excessive. It was not at all uncommon for us to find a mortgage instrument that would close out in three years and give about a 30% return over the three years for sure. No ambiguity, for sure. That was the good news. The bad news was you found about one of these for every five you looked at. And you had to pay a team of six lawyers and PhD finance professor types to find it, to pore over the documents, to read through it all, and an accounting firm as well. And in the end, you couldn't put any money. It wouldn't take very much money out of a fund at all. So they're not scalable. And that'll be an illustration of something later. They have information issues associated with them. Some are statistically suspect. So volatility tests are one example. One observation people make is that if stock prices, and this is, um, this is allegiance to a particular theory of how valuation goes on, suppose stock prices are the discounted value of all the dividends a stock will pay. Well, we observe the market has a lot of volatility. Prices go up and down a lot. The dividends don't go up and down very much. So if dividends are just discounted, if prices are just discounted dividends, how can they have all this volatility when the thing they're discounting doesn't? The problem is uh, the process of discounting comes close to what's called a unit root process. It's very, very close to being non-stationary. So very slight changes in the rate of growth of dividends can have big profound effects upon the price. And so what used to be clear from the simple story I told you when you start to delve into it, it becomes more and more difficult. Uh, I was once listening to a talk on this topic, and I sort of leave these when they become very uh, hoary, esoteric discussions about the statistical underpinnings of these things. And a friend of mine, who was Turkish, turned to me and said, we have a saying in Turkey, it says, if you torture the data long enough, it will confess to any crime. <laughs> so, they're fleeting. This is the Heisenberg principle of finance. 
we had a long anomaly where we discovered that in two out of three years, till about 1980, small stocks would outperform large stocks in two out of three years. I learned about this, and the world learned about this in 1980, so immediately I positioned a portfolio to buy small stocks. Hasn't happened since. Yeah. Well, 50-50 since. So I took this as the Heisenberg principle. It could be Ross's, but when I find out about it, it disappears. But it is sort of the Heisenberg principle. There is a wonderful study by Bill Schwartz that examines this very issue. He observes that as anomalies have been discovered over time, the length of time they continue to seem to have some force is declining rapidly. So it appears the industry for exploiting these things is growing more efficient and discovering them and exploiting them more quickly. The information cost one is the one I talked about. A bigger class, sort of a bigger class of issues for these people, are the prices don't equal fundamentals. So internet stocks in the whole market. You say, well, you couldn't possibly explain internet stock prices by any potential theory of their dividends. It isn't quite true. Royal Dutch Shell and Shell Trading. Well, this is an example of an arbitrage of a sort. Uh, Royal Dutch Shell is actually the largest equity company in the world. But there's two companies. There's Dutch Trading, there's tra the trading company and Royal Dutch Shell. Royal Dutch Shell, Shell Trading is a British company. Royal Dutch Shell is a Dutch company. They're not actually companies. They're just sort of, no pun intended, they're the shells which own the big company. And they own it at a ratio of about 50-50, slightly favorable to one or the other. And all they do is they just divide up all of the income and profits of this company 50-50. So the stocks should sell for the same price. Sometimes they do, and they seem to deviate away from it. And this is considered an arbitrage, and people supposedly take advantage of this. This is one of those things, my objection to this is that the contract that governs this is 100 years old and it's four pages long. Anyone who's done anything, you buy a house, your contract is more than four pages long. No contract that's four pages long survives legal scrutiny in the modern era. So I have great suspicions about whether, uh, my view is that the betting every time the price deviates is that one group or the other will take advantage. But fundamentals, the problem is they're inherently ambiguous. You tell me that the market is overvalued, I have to go out and find out whether or not the price earnings ratio is too high or the dividends. I, I somehow have to say that the fundamental cash flows that underlie that price are right, and that requires a model, a mathematical model, to transfer those flows into prices. And we can argue about the model. There's one case where we can't. Closed end funds, and that's going to be our example. And it's become really a poster child for behavioral finance. The real example of an anomaly that is difficult to make go away. You're all familiar with an open-end fund. You give them $100, you buy into a mutual fund, you want your money back to give you the value of the stocks they bought. I'm just going to talk about open-end stock funds, closed-end stock funds. So they make a market in their own stock, as it were. They, you can redeem your shares in the open-end fund at any time for whatever, you know, you give them a million dollars and they buy whatever portfolio they have, it goes up or down in value, you say, I want my money back. They say, well, your shares are worth this now, they give you your money back. A closed-end fund doesn't work that way at all. Probably you shouldn't even use the word fund with it. It's just the world's simplest company. What it does is it sells its shares to the public. It usually has a single offering of shares, so maybe it raises $100 million raises $100 million, takes $100 million in, takes the $100 million and buys a portfolio of traded stocks on the market. And it has a management that manages that portfolio in an effort to exceed the market return. Right? So it buys them. Sometimes it has other mandates. And now if you want to get out of the fund, it's like getting out of a company. You have to sell your share in the company. They don't promise to give you a portion of the $100 million back. Whatever they have, they've invested it in this portfolio, that's there forever. You own a share of this company, so you go to your broker and you sell it. That's what happens. It's very easy, unlike a, a real company, it's very easy to see what this company is worth at any moment of time. You just look in, they publish what their portfolio holdings are, and you just add up the value of all the stocks they hold, and that's what they're worth. Similarly, you can figure out how much their shares are worth. 
You add up all the shares they've sold and multiply it by the price per share on the market. Traditionally, what happens is the net asset value of the company, which is to say the value of all the shares that they hold in their portfolio, exceeds the value of their shares that they're selling to the public. Not untypically, they might own $100 million worth of shares of stock, and yet their shares sell for $85 million. So there's a 15% discount. Here's an example. The Tricontinental Corporation is the largest closed-end fund traded in the world, which isn't very large. These aren't too large. This is about $3 billion, but there's a lot of them. If we add it all up, there might be a couple of hundred billion dollars. Depends on how you count the East European funds. Two, three hundred billion dollars worth of closed-end funds in the world. This is the discount from 1979 to 2000 on the closed end, on the Tricontinental Corporation. So the first point there is about 30, 32%, something like that. That means that the value of its shares that it held was 32% higher than the value of the shares its company. The company was worth 32% less than the portfolio it held. And as you see, it bounces around. Occasionally, it passed through zero and went to a premium. There are a few periods in time where it was worth, uh, let's, for example, it held $3 billion worth of stock, but its own stock was worth $3 billion, $200 million. Okay, a little bit of a premium. But most of the time, it lived at a discount, continuing to live at a discount today. Here's the stylized life cycle of the discount. Typically, the fund is born, which means it goes through an initial public offering, and it's usually, it sells for $100 million, it buys $100 million worth of stock, and almost the next day, it sells for $110 million. So it goes to a 10% premium. Within about a month and a half, the premium disappears and it goes to a discount. And then it sells at a discount, 20%, 15% for the rest of its life, until at the very end, and these funds die, uh, someone says, or the company says, we're going to dissolve the fund. And dissolving the fund is really opening it up. So when you open up the fund, you say, all right, you can redeem your shares that you own in the fund for the stock we hold. And so it has to sell like an open-end fund for whatever the price of the shares it holds is. Okay. This is a bunch of puzzles. They, close, they sell, let's go through the first one, most important one. They trade at a discount from their net asset value. That's the most puzzling thing of all. How can two things, in my world of no arbitrage, how can two assets, which have exactly the same cash flows, sell for different amounts? How can you buy this fund for $85 million when it owns $100 million worth of stock? That is an affront to me, an affront to the theory that I hold so dear. These other things. How do they begin at a premium? How can it possibly be that people, especially since on average it goes to a discount, why do people buy these things at 10% over the value of, in a month that I have to go to a discount? I don't think that's a surprise. That goes back to the other man. Not everything that happens in financial markets is anomalous or surprising. Uh, I could convince an audience of finance professors, I could convince all of you to buy a closed end fund. It's just a sign. I mean, with the the what we say is this is bought by dentists in Kansas. That's the sort of theory. It's perfectly plausible, but once it gets into the marketplace, the dentists sell it, it goes to a discount. Because that's what it should be selling for, a discount. How did the dentists get to buy it the same way the finance professors do? So I tell you the following story. I say, you know, well, uh, I know about a closed-end fund that's coming into market. It's going to be a very small fund. It's a very special fund. And you know, I have an allocation, you're my friend, I'm going to sell you some of this stuff. I'll give you $25,000 worth of it. This is a fund that's been started by George Soros and Warren Buffett. It's their own special fund. It's the only thing they're ever going to be involved in anymore. And they've hired Peter Lynch. He's a partner too. He's going to run it for them. You know? So legendary names in the world of finance. Don't you want 25? It'll go to a premium as soon as the world discovers that these people are involved. I tell you, every finance professor would buy this stuff. Yeah, and a month and a half later, you go to a discount. <laughs> I don't find it a mystery that people get suckered into things. That doesn't bother me. 
They are an enduring puzzle. They are the poster child of behavioral finance. And they've generated an enormous behavioral literature. These are just two of over 150 articles on the subject. So how can a neoclassical finance guy reconcile this data with this theory? Well, the first paper was written by Malko. He's the guy who sort of started this whole literature, but he's not a behavioralist. And he looked at kind of three basic effects. One was agency costs. Well, funds are run, they have management fees. So maybe the management fees explain this discount. Well, management fees are very small. 30, 40 basis point, three tenths of a percent. So they can't explain a 15 or 20 percent discount on the fund. But that wasn't a problem. Furthermore, the discount is insensitive to interest rates, but if the discount is the discount of value of the fees that management will take out, then if interest rates go up, that should go down. If interest rates go down, that should go up. Yeah. And there would always be a cost of percentage, so it, somehow it doesn't fit. There are tax effects. There are complicated capital gains embedded. I've gone through the tax effect. Others have as well. Tax effects just aren't of an order of magnitude to explain it. The liquidity of fund holdings is sometimes used. Well, you think the fund is worth 100 million, but that's because they're holding horribly illiquid stocks, and the prices or marks that you see on them aren't reflective of the real price you could sell them for. But that's not true. I can show you a fund that sells a $120 million fund that sells at about a 20% discount which, as I recall, last I looked at it had three holdings. It had IBM, Xerox, and one other. It was all it held, which are not illiquid holdings. I think it was Exxon was the third. The behavioralists have an explanation. Discounts and premiums, they say, are a function of investor sentiment. And so investor sentiment is correlated across, we're all happy or sad together. And that implies that discounts are correlated across things. So, uh, and arbitrage, they say, is costly. So it's very difficult for me to buy the fund, unwind the fund, so buy it at 85, unwind it, and sell the stocks it holds for 100 and make 15. Right? And in part, they're right. Certainly, there's going to be a lot of uh, competition, but it's a costly activity to do that. And management, which is getting these fees, fights it. But that's a clue. Management fights it. Why would they fight so hard, which they do, for something that isn't worth so much? It is worth a lot. So I'm going to resuscitate an old theory. And I'm going to try and argue that you can explain all of the phenomena about closed-end funds from the fees that managers charge. Everything you see can be explained from the fees. The problem was, Malkiel is, is a very clever fellow. He wrote a random walk down Wall Street, which I encourage everyone, scientist or otherwise, to read. It's a wonderful piece of work. But he wrote the book and he studied the problem before we knew about option pricing theory. Now we know about option pricing theory. And we wouldn't try and figure out the value of the discount or the value of the fees that a manager charges for running a fund by discounting the cash flows. There's just too many things we'd have to project. It's easier than that. Let me take you through an argument. Suppose you open a bank account and you put $100 into the bank account. Suppose that interest rates are 10%. Okay. Uh, so you get $10 a year. And let's say it's done in perpetuity, forever. You can't take your money out. It's some sort of a trust. You put the $100 in, they put it in a bank account, and it earns $10 a year. But the bank charges you something for this. The bank charges you 1% a year for doing this. So here's what happened. Every year, you make $10, nine of it goes to you, and a dollar goes to the bank. What's the discount? It's 10%. Because the interest rate is 10%. You're getting $9 a year forever. You'd have to put $90 in at 10% to get $9 a year. You just have to find someone to do it who wouldn't charge you 1%. That's what it means to have an interest rate of 10%. But of course, the argument doesn't depend on the interest rate at all. Interest rate could be 20% or 5%. You get the same answer. You've put your money into something. You put $100 into something. And every year, you take 90% of the cash flow, and they take 10% of the cash flow. 
the value of the 100 you put in has suddenly dissipated by 10%. You have 90% of the claim on that. They have 10% of the claim on that. That's what's going on here. And since this is a math audience, fees are derivative. They're just an option on the fund's NAV. And that derivative will get more interesting as we look at more complicated cases. But for math, we have Greek symbols. This is half a proof that I can do math. Uh, fixed fees and expenses is a percentage of the NAV delta. Dividend payout, the cash they pay out to you every year, psi. What's the discount? Delta over delta plus psi. That's the percentage of the total proceeds that goes to management. What's left goes to you. So it sells at a discount. The world's simplest option, just a proportionate option, linear option. You can start to, to gussy it up a little bit. Some funds close out on particular dates. You know today that it will end in five years. So you can go through a replication argument and say, well, how much would I have to buy of their portfolio to replicate the cash flows I'll get over five years? And not surprisingly, you get an answer like that. Delta divided by delta plus psi times one minus an exponential, where t is the time horizon for when it disappears. Notice again, no interest rates or market variables show up in this, independent of how the market prices things. This is an example of a class of options for those who are interested in which when you solve the partial differential equation for the value of the option, the solution doesn't have a second order term in it. So volatility doesn't matter because the structure is linear. Okay. Here's a more complicated one. Uh, let's say the dividend payouts follow a complex structure like this. So what we do is we appeal to modern finance, we do a risk neutral valuation. For those who are into this stuff, you get a second order partial differential equation based on this process, and you solve that, and you get, oops, I have to go back, and you get that for the answer. So D is the dividends and DF is the discount. Notice an interesting feature about this. The discount on the fund is a constant minus B times the dividends divided by S. S is the value of the stocks they hold. D is the dividend rate that they pay out. That's the cash flow that they pay out. They're effectively obliged to pass out all the dividends on the stock and all the capital gains they realize. So the net capital gains they realize they have to pass out to the investors. Right? Notice that as the capital gains D rises, as they pay a higher percentage out to the investor, A and B are positive, and the discount declines. Just what you would have gotten by just doing a comparative stack st static study of the simple one. So the more money that goes to the investor, the less goes to the manager. At the extreme, if I were to pay a liquidating dividend and give all the money to the investor, the discount would have to disappear. Right? Oh, I did it again. There we go. value depends then on the payout policy of the fund. What we'd expect is you should model the payout policy of the fund, and this becomes a problem like a well-known problem in option pricing theory. What is the value of an option on a stock that pays a dividend where the dividend follows some process? So we model the process, and then we figure out what the value of the option is. That's what, the, that's what these people have. They have an option. The manager has an option, and the residual from the option, what's left over, is what the fund, the fund investors have. And of course, negatively related. What we've discovered is a lot of things. There's a positive feedback from discounts to payouts. That's not surprising. The bigger the discount on the fund, the more likely it is that the stockholders will rebel. And there are a handful of examples where rebelling stockholders have actually forced funds to open up, depriving the managers of their fees. So not surprising we discover that as the discount widens, the managers pass more money out to the shareholders narrowing the discount back. Right? Payouts depend negatively on performance relative to a benchmark. So the higher your performance, well that's sort of an interesting thing, the higher your performance, what happens? Well, if you outperform the benchmark, you don't give the investors as much. Because you say they're going to be happy anyway. Right? 
and payouts are designed to maintain a constant NAV. We found three or four funds in a data set that have that policy. They always pass out a constant percentage. Wonderful thing about those funds, the original formula that I showed you, psi divided by psi plus delta, that is what they sell for. That is their discount. I won't do the IPO premiums. That's my story about these things. Here's my data set. So I have an extensive data set. There's, this might surprise It's tradition in finance to spend a lot of time talking about what the data is, but not in finance lectures. Theory meets the data. I have a sample of funds. This is the average discount that I found out of these 25 funds. I created these funds, looked at the average discount over a 20-year period, and it was very hard to get this because you have to get data on their fees and their prices. There's a lot of complicated stuff that is not easy to get. But we found 25 funds out of the whole funds that we could get the data on over a 20-year period. And in theory, using the parameters of these funds, the discount should have been 7.7%. But actually, the discount was 7.7%. This is a wonderful example. I did not concoct this. I used that simple formula. It hit right on the money. But of course, this is an average. And averages, uh, unfortunately, subsume a lot of very interesting detail. While it's true for the average, it's not true for the individual fund. So there's enormous variation. If you look down the first two columns, the first column is the ticker symbol for the fund in the data set. And the second column is the theoretical discount that you get from that simple theory. And the third one is a theoretical discount with expenses taken. Now that's a complicated issue. Do you take not only the manager's fee, but the expenses they charge? And that's a problematic question because mutual funds charge expenses too. And even though it worked out to 7.7 uh, .7 as the average of the theoretical discount and 7.7 .7 as the average actual discount, as you go up the second column and the fourth column, you see some dramatic differences. Fund by fund, it doesn't work. It just seems to be an accident that it works on average. So you have to explain what happens within the funds. When, do we close at 8? All right, I'll, I'll try and go quickly through that. Discounts are correlated. So this is something you find in the data. Uh, they move with NAVs and NAVs rise with the market. That's my explanation. The behavioral explanation is very different. They say, well, discounts are correlated because people grow happy or sad together. When they grow happy, discounts narrow. When they grow sad, discounts widen. Well, they may well be happy or sad together. By the way, they don't appear to be because a friend has just run some, the Michigan has this index of consumer sentiment. So he's run a regression of consumer sentiment and see how correlated it is with discounts. Doesn't seem to be any correlation. So maybe they get happy and sad together. But isn't that a rather trivial way to have this wonderful phenomena be coordinated across funds, to have the discount on funds rising and falling together because everyone's happy or sad together? Uh, that very much. See, that's theory by, like, theory should have a little magic to it. There should be just a very simple thing that produces a wonderful richness of results. That's what you can get out of this neoclassical explanation. But when I tell you that the discount goes up and down because everyone's happy or sad together, you watch me put the rabbit in the hat and you see me take it out. So it doesn't seem to be very surprising. You know? It's correlated because they move with NAVs, and NAVs rise when the market rises. So we've seen the discount depends on the net asset value because it's the payout relative to the net asset value. If there's inertia in the payout, then when the NAV rises, the discount should rise. Country funds, this was a wonderful observation. You look at the India fund or the Korea fund. Now the discount, from a financial perspective, you would think that the discount should rise or fall with movements in the Indian market or the Korean market. These are funds that are traded in the United States but hold Indian stocks or hold Korean stocks. The discount goes up and down more with the movement of the S&P 500 than it does with their own country. Why? Very straightforward. You talk to, I talk to the managers of these funds. So why is that true? Well, because when the U.S. market goes up, it doesn't matter what the Indian market is doing. When the U.S. market goes up, our folks are unhappy about it. And so we have to give them a bigger payout. 
you give them a bigger payout, discounts narrow. You observe that the payout they give rises with changes in the U.S. market, leaps in the U.S. market, and declines when the U.S. market declines. There's nothing behavioral here. They're trying to save their jobs. All right, see, I told you it was a very unbiased view of this. Here's my view of neoclassical versus behavioral. Here's what I like about neoclassical and I don't like about behavioral. Parsimony versus ad hocery. I got those answers from no arbitrage and efficiency. I didn't pull in anything else. I just had those two little things working for me. And I had to build upon a wonderful neoclassical apparatus about how you value assets given those two features. All right, just derivative pricing theory. This is based on psychology. Psychology produces too many answers and no theory. Any psychologists in the office? People are optimistic or pessimistic, they're both. I have found contradictory explanations in this literature of the same phenomena. You want to explain something, you just go and say, well, it's people's behavior, what do they do? They're optimists, they're pessimists. Everyone at any one time is any of the above things. I'm not sure this is theory, this isn't theory. This is ex post explanation. This strikes me as having the same force of theory as what I read in the Wall Street Journal after the market has gone up, or after the market is, why did it go down? Profit taking. <laughs> why did it go up? People were happy, you know? This isn't science. Here's an extraordinary thing. Neoclassical theory, go back to what I said about the nickels. Neoclassical theory predicts not just the sign of these effects, it predicts the magnitude of the effects. And behavioral theory, the, the application of psychological arguments, which I don't think, by the way, are very strongly taken arguments, the application of those arguments told, told you the sign it was positive or negative, but it never told you the magnitude. You know, it's not that I'm right, it's just that I'm putting up a much stronger collection of, the of results here. It's much easier to shoot me down and prove I'm wrong. When I put a number up there, you can look and see is it the right number. When I put a sign up there, gee, you know, half the time I'm right. You know, <laughs> it's the right hand side or the left hand side. <laughs> well, I won't do this. <laughs> we'll leave. We'll, I said enough. All right. So the bottom line is this. We have this extraordinary edifice called neoclassical finance. It's tough. It's not an easy collection of theories. It's very much like Newtonian mechanics was before quantum theory. That's what the behavioralists tell us. They said before the quantum theory, everyone believed neoclassical stuff. And then you had a variety of sort of nagging kinds of observations that made it harder and harder to believe in uh, Newtonian mechanics. But you still build bridges with Newtonian mechanics. No one sits around doing quantum theory to decide how to fix a highway or build a bridge or probably even to build a jet, you know? You do an awful lot of stuff with neoclassical things. You do an awful lot of things with Newtonian mechanics. And I do think it's a little bit of hubris to think that this is the quantum theory of social science. Uh, there are wonderful, interesting phenomena being proposed by these folks, things in the data. It takes me a long time, and it's hard work to try and explain them. I'm not sure I can explain them all, but I know I can explain a lot more than they would give credit for. And until I'm through explaining everything, until I have truly exhausted it, you know, I don't mean just me, I mean folks like me who believe in this neoclassical theory as having enormous scientific power, until I'm done with that, I'm not prepared to throw my hands up. Or someone said, if you're going to shoot at the king, which is what this is, you best aim to kill. Right. So I'll leave you with that note. Thank you very much. I mentioned that Professor Ross is on the board of Freddie Mac. He's actually going to be at a meeting. Thoughts about exchange traded funds. Um, for example, uh, uh, there's iShares for uh, uh, Korean and Taiwan funds, the WT, WJ for Japan, and they charge, well, not Japan, but like Taiwan and Korea have expense ratios on the order of 
1.2 or 3 percent. It doesn't seem to me that they trade at any substantial discount. Right. One of the reasons they don't trade at a discount is you can actually exchange them and you can get the underlying assets, unlike a closed-end fund. But that, that raises a, an extraordinarily hard question, the answer to which I'm only beginning to kind of understand. The puzzle isn't closed-end funds. The puzzle is open-ended funds. Open-end funds charge the same amount as closed-end funds. So an open-end fund charges a 1% management fee. Why don't the people race out the door to, to get rid of that fee? They don't. So I don't quite understand that. Uh, the closest I come to an explanation is that that 1% fee at the margin must pay for some service people in the fund think they get. That's the closest I can explain. I think that's a more profound and certainly a bigger issue than the closed-end fund question, and one which I just am beginning to nibble at. There is a real role for behavioral stuff, and behavioral stuff is the essence of why people buy certain funds rather than others. And there's an awful lot going on in that literature about uh, flows of funds and things like that. That has real merit to me. It's about the quantity side rather than the price side. But I'm still in the camp that says it doesn't have much explanatory power for prices. Thank you. Any other questions? No psychologists in there. I always get some psychologists who can be angry players. No. Yeah. Uh, they might be, but these funds are an example, and certainly index funds, uh, you know, avoid much of those transactions costs. So you can think that a fund is a way of uh, cheaply avoiding transactions costs, but in fact, it's hard to access that. I can show you funds that have extraordinarily stable portfolios; they hardly change over time. So if they hardly change the portfolio over time, they're not incurring any costs at all. So you could do that yourself if you wanted to. Uh, I mean, what you could do, the College Retirement Equity Fund, for example, is you know 50 times larger than any fund in the world. It holds every stock the funds hold. It could just sell out, carve a little piece of it out, sell it, and buy the fund for a 10 or 15% discount, and then own all the stocks indirectly that the fund holds. Why don't they do it? Because they don't want to pay the manager, because the manager charges a fee. Right? Other questions? Okay, well, um, thank you very much. No one asked quite a very quiet audience question. I don't know.